Good evening. Welcome to the program, Artist and Critic. I'm Don Gray. With us this evening is the distinguished American collector of art, Mr. Robert C. Skull. Mr. Skull, of course, uh, his collection or a portion of it was auctioned uh, approximately two years ago at the Park Burnett Gallery in New York City for a record-breaking approximate $2.2 million, and a painting by Jasper Johns went for approximately two and a half, uh, $245,000, uh, setting the highest price for an American artist. Mr. Skull, uh, during your, that period shortly before the auction, uh, during the auction and uh, following the auction, Jeff Vaughn assigned a camera crew to you, very tightly to follow you, and to uh, explore just what happened before during the, uh, the auction. What did it feel like to have that camera crew following you? Well, it'll never happen again, I can <laughs> tell you that. That's about the way I felt. It was uh, exposing myself at a, at a time when uh, it was rather difficult, and having a camera crew, there were three crews all together, and following me around for a week. Uh, ten days, including three days after the auction, was a very, very difficult situation. And uh, we were going through a lot. A lot of problems were happening that week. and It was I mean, a difficult situation. Just in terms of the stress of the right. auction itself? I finally am able to look at the picture now. In other words, it took me a year to, to be able to look at the movie uh, uh, with a little more objectivity. Certain attachment. Uh, yeah. There. Uh, you seem so really kind of at ease in the movie and relatively unaware of the camera. Really unaware of the camera, I feel. I have seen the movie. Uh, were you unaware? I guess you weren't from your comment before, but uh, you seem to have a presence in front of the camera. Well, I was aware of it, and I made up my mind that I was going to try to go about my business in the most ordinary way. I didn't want to play to the camera right. because that would have been a different movie entirely and I'm not an actor so I tried to do it just go through my motions with whatever I had to go through and most of the time I forgot the camera was there. Just be, being yourself as much yeah. as possible in the circumstances. In the back of my mind it was I knew it was getting down on film but uh, I tried very hard to deal with it uh, as though it were not there. When you did see the film what was your reaction to it? Uh, did you feel that it was an accurate picture of the events that had taken place in your emotional state or mental state at the time? Yeah, I, I felt that uh, he had done a very credible job. I felt that it was honest, hmm. that chronologically it was honest. There was no fooling around with the time periods, putting one piece before the other. Uh, the film was cut beautifully by uh, Leia Siegel, who was really a remarkably good editor. I think that Jeff Owen did a very, very good job, even though I wasn't the happiest man in the world uh, when I first saw it. But I do, in retrospect now, believe that uh, it was really a very honest documentary. What was your reaction the first time you saw it that uh, led you to say this, that you weren't totally happy well, with it? Or did, what, what did you think it was, was saying? I mean, did you, I mean how, how were you uncomfortable with it? I was uncomfortable, first of all, seeing my image up on a screen. Seeing yourself, you mean? That's yeah. number one. Uh, uh, number two, I... Uh, I felt that that week was a very, very heavy week. It had to do with a lot of decisions involving a lot of paintings that I was uh, very deeply involved with, with a lot of artists that I was involved with. And uh, I found it a, a difficult procedure to watch it unfold again, mm. relive it, so to speak. Uh, there was some talk in the, in the media, really essentially about the media, I guess, that there had been so much uh, talk about the value of the, the money angle of the collection, just as I was mentioning at the introduction of the show, rather perhaps than the uh, aesthetic value of the art or the artwork itself. Somehow the money overshadowed the art. Did, how, how did you feel about that? Did you feel it was... You know, when, uh, art, when art is made inspirational, really wonderful, the moment that it's finished, it the moment a, a collector looks at it, buys it, a dealer becomes involved with it, art starts to be involved with money. I'm no longer ashamed of that. Years ago, I was very, very, you know, like, put off by it. But art is a commodity, one of the most important and most costly commodities in the world today. Why should we be ashamed of it? Right. I think that's one thing, I think that's one of the hardest 
things for an artist to realize. <laughs> and it, it, it is a reality and it is yeah. a fact of life, as you say, that somehow this private labor, labor in the studio with great dedication and great perseverance and great problems perhaps being overcome and then suddenly to see it out in the marketplace and being a commodity. But it is. It, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, it's, it's, that's the way we're not, we're not involved with the world the way it could be or should exactly. be or will be. It's the way, the it, way is. it is. It's the way it is. And art uh, is as much involved in its own kind of uh, development and promotion as any other worthy object in the world. You've been known as a collector of pop art, but you have collected, of course, uh, a number of other types of artists and kinds of artists. What, what kinds of artists have you been involved with in the past well, when people thought of you? I'll describe that in a moment, but in connection with what I just said, I want you to know that at no time did I ever buy a painting because of its value. Mm. I bought it because of the experience. And if right. anybody had told me when I bought those paintings that they were going to be worth a hundred times as much as I paid them, I thought I would think that they were they were crazy. They were crazy. So yeah. that what happened with it had its own pace and its own development and yeah. its own life. I, mm -hmm. I really didn't know. I am involved with art purely from the standpoint of experience. Mm -hmm. I love most of the artists I've been involved with. I've had uh, wonderful, wonderful relationships with them. And lo and behold, if the art became worth money, that's another, yeah, that's another right, thing. Right. That's another thing. Uh, this leads me to another thing, perhaps. Uh, uh, I, I get the feeling that uh, people are jealous of, of you as a collector. Is that too crude a way to put it? Or c could you respond to that? Uh, are, are people jealous of your uh, success as a collector in terms of either quality of art you've collected or the monetary returns that, as you say, have just happened to turn out that way? I think I feel a little bit of that hostility that you're talking about. I've met a lot of people who never met me before and have come to me with a uh, hostile reaction uh, because of the way the media has put forth my case and so forth. But I really tell you that it doesn't really matter to me who likes me and who doesn't. You know, I, I'm going to be, uh, I was just 60 years old and I don't have time anymore for that kind of nonsense of speculating on whether the world loves me or not. I'm really interested in my next experience. I'm not interested in, in worrying about whether people are going to like me or not. Let's hope that I have a good average of people <laughs> who care about what I'm doing or not, yeah, but it really right. doesn't matter to me. Right. And I, I think that, I think that um, that's the way I have to carry on. Well, again, that's one of the realities of life. Again, in a sense, I, that we, I suppose we'd all like to be loved Totally, but uh, the reality is that I don't think I can handle total oh, love. <laughs> I can handle total love if I can get it from one person okay. here and there. Well, well, that's all I can handle. That'll tide you over, right? Total love, I couldn't, okay. couldn't deal with it. What What are you collecting now? I, I remember you mentioned that you're very interested in a really quite realistic sculptor. You also have uh, a large painting by a. Uh, you've described. I, I guess maybe we could describe him as a symbolic folk artist. You, you mentioned that he brings you know, up his personal yeah. experiences and so forth. I'd like to answer in, in a way that would be comfortable. People like categories. I like this kind of art or that kind of art. I can't accommodate you. I like any kind of art. Mm -hmm. I own huge boulders, stones in Nevada, which I see maybe once a year. And I also now am having a bust made of my head in the most traditional kind of materials like clay. It's going to be cast in bronze. Mm. I own uh, a man that's making probably the most uh, impressive kind of folk art today. Uh, in other words, I can't answer in terms of categories, which is the most wonderful thing that's mm. happened with art in the last few years. A man can paint whatever way he wants without worrying whether it's fashionable or whether there's a fad or whether uh, people collecting a certain category of painting. I think that's very detrimental to art in general. Everybody's doing his own thing, and if I see something I like, I buy it. Right. That's about what it's all. Well, this sort of ties in with what we were going to be talking about in terms of what you had collected in the past. You had refused to be categorized then, hadn't you? I mean, sure. you, you had a broad. When I collected abstract on... expressionism, I started to buy pop. A lot of abstract expressions were very upset with what I was doing because they thought I should defend abstract expressionism. Well, I don't have to defend anything. Mm. 
I buy art, and I don't want to get into the polemics of, of uh, art critics who feel that certain uh, areas should be protected. I'll buy anything I like, and if people don't like it, that really is not my problem. They have to deal with their own problem. My problem is to deal with art in, a, in an honest way. If I'm moved by a work of art, if I respond to it, I don't even care why. I don't care what category it's in. It's tiresome to read articles by art uh, writers, and I, when I get through with the article, I'm completely confused. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they're talking right. about. I really don't care about it. Why, why, why do, does the art uh, crowd, I guess we could say, as Sophie Burnham uh, described them, the, the critics and curators and so forth, why do they latch on to the one and only movement that uh, s does seem to dominate a given time? As you were mentioning, the abstract expressionists, they, it was almost a dictatorship in terms of the poss what possible art could be practiced. Well, why, why do they... Uh... Because you develop a, a sense of history about something you care about, and they feel that anything else is an attack. I don't have any position to defend. Maybe a writer who does a book on abstract expressionism has a great deal to defend. Maybe, and I don't put down their importance. There has to be, there has to be a catalyst who will explain to the general public a great deal about art that may not be apparent. So that the art writer, I suppose, is doing a job that's very necessary. People write about theater, they write about other arts and so forth. But I myself have fought against um, worrying about what art critics think about the things I buy. And that's where I found some real strength. I found that's where I was strongest. Just go with my intuition. Just, just go with that and trust that and nothing else. Well, you're really on, on uh, bedrock, in a sense, when you're dealing with yourself, because then you're not subject to the ebb and flow of uh, whatever the critical opinion is of the moment exactly. and so forth, and you're exactly. fairly at ease with yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, what, in, in a little more detail, what, uh, how do you go about collecting? What, what is the process? Uh, you, you have a business. Uh, how much time do you devote to your business on a given day, and, and how do you spread the time between that and your collecting? Is it... Okay, can it be discussed? And, sure, uh, sure. I don't have a method, but, uh, you know, when you uh, own several artists, let's say you start off with owning several artists, you get to know them. You bought a piece of their life. Right. You bought a piece of their time, their thought. And usually, uh, I will find out about other artists from them. If I, if I care for an artist's work and I respond to it, and he says to me, I have a friend down the street, down the Bowery, I'd like you to come down and see a couple of his paintings. You, you visit that second painter sympathetically because already you respect the man that you bought. Right, so through friendships, through knowing what, you know, that's the way it goes. I don't have any special way because there are all kinds of collectors. There are collectors who collect on a Saturday afternoon and go into a gallery and buy. There are collectors who know an artist and they buy him. There, there are all levels of collecting. Some people don't want to know the artist. They'd rather do business with the dealer and they don't want to know the artist. Well, I find my greatest joy is in, is in becoming involved with the artist's life. And now I'm buying almost exclusively in that way, uh, just from artists from that artists. I'm very friendly with. Right? Yeah. So ha you formally dealt with dealers to a great extent, or you sort of, it was started a brand off with in dealers. a sense? Started yeah. off with dealers, seeing exhibitions and museums, and then I would uh, find out who the dealer was, and then I would maybe meet the artist after I bought a painting. And now I, uh, I'm doing my, my thing almost exclusively with artists. Will you, perhaps on a given day, start to go to the office and then you say, hey, I'd rather go down to say <laughs> such and such as loft or something? It's happened more than once. Has it? <laughs> it's happened more than once. I, de I deal with art every day. I deal with, with artists uh, at one moment during the day, either it's a phone call or it's uh, a problem that he has with, with uh, his work. Uh, in other words, I can't conceive of a day in which I'm not mm. uh, deeply involved in some mm. problem having to do with art. Uh, you mentioned a self-portrait, uh, I'm sorry, a portrait being done by a sculptor uh, right. now. Uh, Alfred Leslie did a portrait of you mm, three years back or so, and, and you mentioned that it's really a, quite a well-known painting too, I would say. Yeah. It's, um, you said it took three years to paint, and, and I, I wanted to ask you, why did it take that long to paint? Well, the first nine months, uh, he just worked on sketches. 
of my head. Uh, he hadn't found a pose yet. He didn't, wasn't comfortable with, with a pose. Uh, after he found the pose, he first started to stretch this nine foot canvas. After that, his friend, uh, he had decided that he wanted to make some paintings commemorating the death of Frank O'Hara, the poet. That's right. So that he stopped working on mine and went back to his. That went on for over three years. And in the 1970, when I, uh, I went to Europe, uh, I grew a beard. And he was almost finished with the picture. When I came back, he, he was very upset that I grew the beard. So he had another three or four months' work to do on that. But uh, it was a difficult... It was a very difficult sitting for me because he's a very exacting artist. He works about an inch away from your head, and he oh, wants to draw. Oh, close? Yeah, he's he's into every pore of your. It doesn't show maybe on the painting, but well, it, he's it, really meticulous. Yeah, though. Ex exceptionally, almost a 19th century kind of yeah. uh, detailist. Yeah. And of course, uh, it was finished about three three years and four months later. It was a difficult assignment for me. Was there a question of? the possibility of the beard going or the beard staying? I mean, how, how upset was he? <laughs> well, was he asked, me, he asked me to remove it. He did? Yes, he did. And I said, no way. And he said, you realize I have to... Well, the form of the face was there, which yeah. made it easier than yeah. if he had to start from yeah. all over yeah. again. But nevertheless, he wasn't very comfortable with it. And finally, he went along with it. And, and uh, it took another four months, from uh, the end of August to uh, November. He's a, he's a powerful painter, and uh, it leads me to ask the question that you were talking before that um, uh, really the art world is more wide open now than it ever has been. Uh, I suppose there would be people who would debate whether it is open or whether it's collapsing or fragmented or whether it truly is open, but it appears to be more open. Um, do you see realism emerging as a... Uh, a force in art in the next uh, year, two years, next decade? It's emerging. It's emerging and it's been a force, but uh, and now it has some sort of respectability. Uh, but I think that it will go through the, the refinement of our contemporary moment now. If you saw the last Leslie uh, exhibition at the Frumpkin Gallery, you realize that he's painting in a 19th century style but psychologically, every figure is very, very contemporary. Exactly. Couldn't have been painted in the exactly. 19th century. Yeah. So I think that every artist brings to it his moment. The figure will never be outmoded. It was overshadowed for a while. Even Pop brought the figure back with Warhol and Wesselman and Oldenburg used the figure. Yeah. In other words, it had a, a submerged uh, quality for about 15 years with Jackson Pollock till about 1960, we'll say 45 to 60. So that the figure will always be a powerful instrument. If you look at the Suvro show on the Whitney now, you'll see the hands that he's done. They're uh, Rodin-esque. They're, they're tremendous. And he's an abstract sculptor who made these fantastic pieces. I haven't seen that. Oh, I'm it's, surprised uh, to hear you say this. When did he make the hands? Are they out 19, of his past? 19, uh, 1958, 59, 1960. Tremendous uh, expressions. Uh, and he works in an abstract style. In other words, he's not hemmed in because someone says you don't do figurative work, it's 1960. He does what he wants. He's an artist who, who says his own thing, and the times will have to conform to his attitude, not he to the times. That's real strength. Well, was that his training? I mean, was he trained in uh, a, a realistic tradition, or did he... I don't know, but that? the hands, I don't know whether he was trained in it or not, but the hands are magnificent. A they are... Great understanding of the form. Great understanding. It. They are, they are uh, powerful, powerful things. A clenched hand with a steel bar through it. Mm. Um, a pointed finger, which, you know, like twice size. Uh, I think uh, what he does is magnificent, whether it's, whether it's abstract or whether it's figured. How, how did you get started collecting? What, what started you being interested in art? How did, how did this whole thing begin and develop and grow? And I often grow? wonder about it. Um, when I was a child, I was asthmatic, and I couldn't get into athletics the way I would have liked to, pressures around, all the other kids being involved with it. And I uh, had to deal with uh, uh, personal and solitary kind of mm -hmm. things. And I found uh, music and art, uh, you know, like came through to me. I used to look at picture books. I finally 
discovered a museum, which was, blew my mind. To see, I thought all paintings were, I thought all paintings were four by five or five by six. I never knew that paintings can, and when I saw them for the first time, I uh, wondered why everybody uh, would be whispering in front of them. Uh, that people would stand in front of the painting and women would tell their children tremendous respect, and I was very impressed with it. And I don't know, I just, I just fell into it. I kept it very secret because I traveled around with my friends who weren't yeah, involved. A tough crowd. <laughs> yeah, right. Did you, though, um, have a, uh, what was it, just some instinctive feeling that is uh, unexplainable? I was I mean, comfortable just... with it, and I liked to draw. I used to copy pictures. I, in other words, it came to me uh, quite naturally. I knew nothing about art. I never had any formal training. All I learned about art was what I used to read in books from libraries that I took out. And no one in my family was deeply involved with it. My father and my mother were immigrants. They had their hands full just uh, making a go of paying the rent and the usual situation like that. I really don't know how it happened that I was receptive to it. I'm glad I was, of course, but I never really understood it. I never tried to analyze. And I think it's because I spent a lot of time alone until I was maybe 15 when suddenly I was involved with sports and so forth. In other words, right. uh, they were lonely years and these things would be my way of spending time. And it's sort of, uh, I think the arts are, are uh, I think that they, they are the uh, means through which people discover themselves, and when they are in solitude, that uh, to read or to write poetry or to sure. listen to music or to paint. It's one of the ways, it, I it, guess, it, that you deal, you learn how to deal with the world. I guess athletics might be another way, and, and there are other endeavors. There are so many different uh, uh, ways in which one can climb on to their own thing. Right. We think of the arts as being connected to the inner person, and maybe sports is to the outer person in a sense. You know, the gregarious yeah. team crowd kind of thing, and the arts, Could be. the quiet, solitary, Could be. maybe, Could I don't be. know. Um, but from this beginning, and through all the years that followed, uh, you've reached your present state where people are asking you for advice in collecting. Are they not? Is, is this a constant deluge of letters and telephone calls and uh, business uh, suggestions yeah. and so forth? I don't want to pretend, I don't want to pretend that I don't like it, uh, because that wouldn't be true. Uh, I enjoy the letters I get from people. They ask me to give them a list of, of painters that I think are <laughs> very important. I'm thinking maybe I'll turn out a scratch sheet like the horse races. And, but I never answer them specifically. I tell them to get involved with an artist on their own, and uh, they will learn every possible thing they can through knowing artists and so on. I can't tell anybody how to be a, be a, a good collector. Do you answer all these? Uh, yeah. You, yeah. You do? Yeah, well, they're sympathetic hmm. letters. They're very nice, and I don't see any reason why I shouldn't write back to someone who took the time to write me. You were offered, I, I believe, a business uh, I don't know how to phrase it, a business position or something as an art buyer or something for some Yes, uh, uh, a firm? mutual fund uh, who wants to invest in art has asked me to do the buying for them. And uh, one of the uh, problems involved, uh, along with many others, which I didn't want to get involved with, is that they wanted me to give up collecting for myself oh, because okay. that would have been a conflict of interest under mm -hmm. the SEC regulations. I didn't like the whole idea anyway. I want to remain an amateur. Uh, in the, sort of the opposite side of the c candle, perhaps, in terms of are you deluged with the letters and slides and pictures from artists yes. who want you to be I wouldn't aware say of deluged. I wouldn't go that far. But I, uh, at least once a week, I get prints and slides in the mail. Well, what is your reaction to them? I mean, do I you, write you look them, at them? I, I look at them. I never tell anybody whether uh, a, work of, uh, a work of art is good or bad. It's not my job, and I wouldn't presume to to know that much. I just, if I respond to it, I write back and I say, you know, like, where do we go from here? But, and if I don't, I say, well, it, it looks beautiful, but I can't deal with it, in other words. Well, I don't well, tell well, anybody whether it's good or not, nobody. Do you collect on impulse, or do you, you I get the feeling that you want to know the artist, you want to know what his life is like, you, I mean, you, do you want to know what he's like as a person as well if as If I know a picture yeah. of his, I'd like to know more about him. I'd like to know more about him personally, yes. Yes, it's part of the enjoyment of painting, owning it.
you would not be what you'd call an impulse collector. I mean, you don't see, yeah, I you buy see something intuitively. In, in, I buy intuitively. I never think too much about it. I can buy the painting first and then ask the artist. That's what I was interested sure. in saying. No, I buy you. completely, you know, I never think much about painting before I buy it. Do you, uh, in, in terms of uh, impulse buying or in terms of the uh, uh, collecting, um, what am I trying to... Uh, ask here. Let me, uh, well, let me go in. Uh, I, I do want to, you seem, well, here's what I was trying to say. The thought uh, came back to me. Uh, you seem more responsive to contact from unknown people, where, where you actually do answer letters. Uh, I get the feeling oh, yeah. that you actually do look at the work, you consider it in terms of oh, its I, uh, sure. merit and so forth, where I feel that many collectors are... Um, Remote from it? Yes. That they wouldn't uh, deign to really almost look at the work, much less answer the artist, as if there's some unholy alliance. I there can't. I can't be... account for that. I think that looking at new art is uh, really a wonderful experience. To see something for the first time done by a person who's a serious artist is really an enjoyable excursion. We're going to have to close. I, I'm really sorry to say we've reached that point, uh, but I really must commend you for that openness to new experience. I think that's what keeps art alive. I think that's what keeps uh, people alive. And, and I'm just constantly amazed how artists and collectors and just human beings close themselves off sure. so much. So it, it really is an enlightened position, I feel. Uh, the program is Artist and Critic. I'm Don Gray. Our guest has been the noted collector, Mr. Robert C. Skull. Thanks very much for watching. Bye-bye.